Um, so just first of all, to just a clarification, because this session was actually scheduled for another talk called Teach Your Pac-Man Machine Learning and Reactive Streams. However, like it was supposed to be myself and Olak Dokuka, but then he came back like in a hurry last night from Netherlands. So he and I never really have time to finish preparing, so I, we apologize for that. So now, actually, I have this talk, which is a more gentle introductory to reactive programming and systems. So I just want to make sure that you are here for what it is. Yeah, and then if you find out that it isn't for you, please feel free to go to another one, too, so that's, don't worry about it. But I just want to um, make sure. And can everybody hear me OK, too? Yeah, OK, cool. Great. So yeah, so my name is Mary Grigleski. I'm a developer advocate at IBM, and I'm from Chicago. And I also run the Chicago Java Users Group, too. So I'm pretty active in the community. So first of all, thank you so much for coming to my talk. And may I ask you, how many of you are already doing like reactive programming or reactive systems? So a few of you, yeah. OK, great. Are you using like, like any kind of library like Akka? Yeah, Vertex, yeah, Aka or Pivotal, uh, Reactor or Rx, right? I guess, I guess so cool. But I think still maybe a lot of you two may not have done any reactive programming or systems yet or trying to get into it. So this is primarily more like an introductory talk. So just want to kind of set it straight, yeah. So hopefully it will make it more fun. It's less of like very much internal stuff because as such, I want to explain everybody knows too, reactive systems are really for concurrent, concurrency, like distributed systems. So we get very deep into things. So hopefully that, that will be my next talk. And then also with Olag, I'll be back here. We plan to come back to Ukraine again and we'll do some Java users group talk. So please stay tuned. So, so that's that. So let me start. So yeah, so as such, actually, my title, I name it like reactive for the impatient, um, if you see on the schedule. But actually, I forgot about that, and I just put down the, because it's too long. So I call it gentle introduction. Well, so essentially, what is like reactive? What it is for is really for very impatient people like us. I mean, ultimately, that's, what, that's why it is there for. Yeah, so. But today, too, I'll be talking about introduction to reactive programming and reactive systems and just a quick survey of, of like four popular um, library, Java library tools and library, um, yeah, uh, popular ones, so over here. And so first of all, let's talk about like why reactive. So like reactive programming and systems are not really all new. If some of you have already worked on it, Especially, like, it actually came out, too, in the 80s when um, Erlang has actually uh, the, the actor model, so which is something that the ACA library is using um, from Lightband. So the ACA model is, is basically built using this uh, supervisor capability, and it's really essentially is for real time, like very responsive systems. And although it, at the time it wasn't like as much as what it is today, like an ACA system, but essentially too, what I'm trying to say is that reactive systems is essentially the fundamental concept is that it has to be highly responsive. You don't want to the, the response time to be like too much. Yeah, like you want to have requests go to your systems, and your, you want the response to come back in a very timely fashion. So it's really designed for us human beings. We can't wait. Like, say, for example, reactive systems with, the, with um, Erlang right, in the 80s is basically for telecommunication. So you can see that like telephone communications are like they are two ways, like duplex. And so it allows you like conversation like in both direction. Because if you think of the old ways would be using walkie-talkie, synchronous. You say something, then you wait, and the other person's like over, the other person will then say something. So that's more synchronous. But the idea is that reactive is you allow kind of this interact, very interactive, highly interactive um, kind of systems to happen. But of course, it's more than just reactive, the responsiveness, it, which we'll go into some more detail. But OK, so that's what, like, why reactive? And then also, too, like, why all of a sudden it becomes more and more popular in the past five or six years? And if you look at it because of the hardware, the CPU itself has get all caught up. We have like multi-CPU, um, multi-core machines, and uh, hyper-threading and all these. So it's essentially, to the software, it used to be kind of easy. Like it's all single-threaded. It makes use of maybe a single CPU, and it does its own thing. But now with multi-core machines, then you actually 
the, the software itself has to be written in such a way that can make use of all of these uh, core within your CPU. For example, multi-processor. Then they have one thread per, you know, per core, for example. And you need better like software systems to kind of take advantage of this hardware um, advance. And then, of course, there's virtualization and container, all of these uh, clustering, all these technology that actually makes it kind of push, basically push the software to go further up up like this in, in terms of sophistication. And if you also think about it in our homes too, it used to be maybe one family when cell phone came out, we used to have maybe one cell phone per family. And now guess what, we have, not only we get one cell phone like per person in a family, you have kids and teenagers, they have multiple devices, you have multiple devices. So as you can see then, like all this data needs to be accessing networking, uh, the, your network, so it needs to be highly efficient. So that's what is like pushing reactive systems to go further. And ultimately, too, here I'm specifying, again, we are very impatient, so that's what it is for. So what is reactive? Let's take a quick look. So if you look, there's a reactive manifesto, and um, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with it, I invite you to take a look, and this is the link. And essentially, it's, it's like a set of principles that lay out and talk about what reactive systems should be. Um, and essentially, to summarize it, we want systems that are highly flexible and very responsive, and also they are all like not, you know, kind of all like detached and not like be, be overly tied to each other. So they can all have like disparate components running in the systems, but yet they are all synchronized like in, in a very coherent fashion. And it has to be highly responsive and very tolerant of failures. And also if there are failures, then failures need to be handled properly too. <coughs> So this reactive manifesto, actually, let me go back. Reactive manifesto actually was led by Lightman, uh, the company that was Martin Odersky's company, that the Scala inventor, um, that company too. So they actually, they are the ones that invented ACA too. So they also came together and defined the reactive manifesto. So the reactive manifesto is basically based on like four principles of reactive systems. React, um, that needs to be, first of all, very responsive. And as we talk about responsive, meaning meaning that requests come in, you need to have response that comes back in a very timely fashion. And then not only that, then you also need to have elasticity built into your system, meaning that if there are more requests coming in, higher loads, then you have to have more resources allocated to serving these, these resources too. And then if like, there are you know, not much requests coming in, then you want to like, free up all these resources to do something else. So essentially, it's that elasticity, scalability aspect of the systems. And then another aspect is the resiliency and recoverability. So if there's any problem that occurs, for example, you need to have good circuit breaking kind of functionality in the system. So if some error occurs, then you want, to, want it to be able to bounce back essentially and, and not have the error propagate through the system. So it needs to be recovered. So that's achieved by a lot of replication and clustering in, in your system too. So you can see to actually reactive systems, our reactive approach is lends itself very well to say microservices type of um, environment because then, then you, it allows you know, all of your services to run in a very, like this, not a tightly coupled way, um, but yet it's very resilient, um, able to kind of bounce back and like that. So it's making use a lot too in today's like, clustering environment. <clears throat> and then all of these like three principles above is essentially made possible by a very message-driven um, nature of the system. So all reactive systems have to be message-driven. So we'll take a look too then into seeing what message-driven is. But first of all, let's, I like to make a distinction too because I've been to various conferences, and then there are people who came to my talk and said, well, they thought they come to a talk and they thought it would be like React, essentially JavaScript React. So just want to kind of point out, I'm sure a lot of you probably are aware, it's <clears throat> here we're talking about reactive systems are not the same as React.JavaScript, because that's JavaScript, and even though they employ some of the principles, they're trying to achieve responsiveness, but it's not in the same we're not talking about the same context between the JavaScript side and Java side. Um, but then there's also, a <clears throat> of course, there's also React.native too, and I just want to point out React Native is for mobile, um, the JavaScript uh, mobile for React.js, and that all comes from, uh, came from Facebook too, as you probably are aware. So, but anyway, so here, let's come back. So I just want to draw some kind of distinction between 
um, reactive programming, functional reactive programming, and reactive systems and architecture. So these, all these, they are not the same. Why? Because in reactive programming, for example, reactive programming is essentially, it, we're talking about um, events. So there are a lot of events flow through a system, and these are like data that are kind of carried in streams, streams of data, comes in in bulk volume. And what drives the logic forward in a reactive programming environment is essentially is the change in state of this data in the stream. So what that drives the logic forward. However, when we talk about functional reactive programming, then essentially it's the threat of execution of your program. It, it's less concerned itself with the data that's carried by a stream. It's more like the threats. Essentially, it's executing, and that's making use of like functional style of programming. So that's functional reactive programming. So they are not the same, if you, you can see, because what drives it is really the threat. And then when we talk about reactive systems and architecture, we are really talking about bringing reactivity to a, to a higher level. It's not just, like say, reactive programming, we're dealing with one component. You're using reactive style of programming to do, to do the internal logic and the data flow. But reactive systems, we're dealing with a whole system. So there are many components. You want to, it's concurrent systems. You want to make sure all of these components don't clash. And kind of one example I want to give to in reactive systems and architecture, I, so as developer advocate, I traveled to different countries too and going to conferences. And actually, I was in India um, back in April this year. And if, if you, I don't know if you've been to India, but it's very interesting because their traffic system, there, there are no traffic lights. So you can imagine, like basically there, you cross the street, it's like all these cars that are coming, and you have buses, shuttle bus, and you know, taxis, and cars, and tuk-tuks. They are like small little kind of um, electric car that are for three people to kind of very economical way of traveling. So you get all these different kind of transportation kind of running through the street. So you, in some ways, I was trying to explain, well, this is kind of, in some ways, is reactive systems. Because you, are, you have many things, they all go at different speeds, and they're going really fast. And you need to be highly responsive if you, as a person crossing the street. So what we did was that, I remember, I, I was there the first time. So I was with my team lead, who actually is originally from India. So he understands how you cross the street. And I remember you have to like, OK, everybody wait. And, Essentially, look, look to the side of the traffic's coming. If there's any gap, let everybody, let's just run across the street. And so you go to the middle strip. Then you stand there and you look the other side, do the same thing, and you, that's how you cross the street. But I was trying to think that, oh, in some ways, it's kind of, you need, it's kind of reactive systems in a very raw, crude way. Because you're trying to like, do things, but yet you don't want things to be clashing. Too. You don't want it to have any traffic accidents. So in some ways, I'm trying to explain, yeah, that's what you need, reactive systems. And plus, we also bring in like, back pressure, too, which is very important in the reactive systems, as some of you may know, too. Back pressure build up if you get like, too many requests coming in. And it can't be processed in time, for example. But in some ways, if you're crossing the street, you can kind of block, you know, you block all the traffic, then all the traffic build up, there could be traffic jam, so that type of stuff. So anyway, so that's just an example of trying to explain reactive systems. So next thing, too, I just want to, want to explain is about event-driven and message-driven. So these two are not the same. So in reactive systems, reactive programming, we're really talking about events. Because it's essentially you have events coming in, they kind of stimulate some action to happen. So that's more event-driven. But in a computing sense, event-driven, what's the difference between that and message-driven is that in event-driven, you like it's like the um, Java messaging systems, like a pub-sub type of environment. You pub, you basically, you broadcast, announce some message. The message doesn't actually have an address associated with it. You just essentially say, I want this, I want that. You are like broadly announcing it. And it's up to whoever is interested in your message to basically subscribe to it. Or what we say in, in, like in uh, Reactor or Rx Java reactive extension, they call those observables. Or now it's like flowables for Rx Java um, that has back pressure support. So it's basically you need to observe. If there are events happen, you are the observer. You observe some events that happen. And so you can tell there's no definite address to it. Now, Whereas in message-driven systems, it's different because then message-driven is really about two known persons or two known components talking to each other. So you know your message is going to a particular destination. So they kind of back and forth. It's much like the old like soap 
system. If you have worked with like soap, <laughs> yeah. So it's more like an envelope. I'm just using an example. It's an envelope. You need to have the address where it is going to and all that. But of course, like for example, a system like Arca, it actually has a lot of location transparency that hides it. So then you don't actually have to worry about you know, where exactly the route, where it is going to. It's all done through configuration. So that's message driven. So those are the differences. So now, just to make everybody hungry, you know, so why do I show this picture? It's just that I'm thinking, right, trying to explain that maybe to someone who hasn't done um, any or reactive programming or reactive systems, they might be wondering, well, why do we want to use it? There are already you know, systems that enable you to do it. You can just use regular Spring MVC to do what you're trying to achieve. And, but anyway, so I was just kind of thinking, OK, that this may be a good um, use case scenario that we can employ a reactive approach. But I'll explain in a little bit, but I just want to kind of, kind of give you some idea that that's what I'm going to talk about after I talk about the next few slides. So, so OK, so um, just some kind of basic terminology if you are fam not familiar with it yet. So for reactivity, when we talk about reactivity, we're dealing with like um, systems that have um, that, that are, um, uh, yeah, sorry, let me see. OK, they're really process of responding to like external stimuli and propagating events. And the events themselves are really stimuli that kind of, you know, events will kind of make someone to respond to, your, to the events that are coming in. And streams are really primitive representations of like a sequence of data elements. And the observables are really stream of events. Um, that's what it is. And design patterns that are used are observer pattern and also composite and iterator patterns. Oops, it's not working. <laughs> yeah, OK. So let me then also explain a little more about uh, reactive programming in this case. I'm borrowing the uh, reactive extension marble diagram so to explain like streams programming. So here, too, if you look at, I have like different lines in here. These kind of represent streams. So streams are there to kind of receive like events. So the marbles themselves represent events. So over here, the top one is like a, a stream that doesn't have any events yet. It's just a stream that's open. And the second one, you see that there are some marbles, and then there's like a perpendicular line. It shows that it's a stream that has a definite timeline to it. So basically, events happen, and then it terminates. The stream finished processing and doing whatever is done, then stream terminates. Then you also have cases in which you can have the third one, which is like a couple marbles and then an X. So the X represents an event too, but the event itself is an error event. So in like reactive programming, Error events are first-class citizen because it's unlike the, like say, traditional style of programming. You have to basically do try, try, catch, and all those things. But yet, in event-driven kind of programming in a reactive style, is that then error is just another event that happens and that requires the caller to take care of to to respond to it accordingly. So, just wanted to explain that. And then the bottom one here too is just an open-ended streams that you it just keeps opening. It's basically any events come in, it will still be like, you know, kind of receiving events. So that's the bottom one. So these are kind of like different streams that, that you, you have. And here too, I'll explain a bit too about um, bringing it a bit into coding level for reactive programming. So if we talk about um, using these streams, and then we are using like functional style of programming to do this. So if you look at over here as an example, using an operator. So, so OK, so that's the thing. In reactive programming, there are still callbacks. I, I got uh, people ask me, too, are there still callbacks? Because if you think about, folks might be saying that why do we need reactive? Because like in, in the old style of doing event-driven programming, then you all, always like add a listener, for example, and then you have callbacks, right? So in reactive programming, there are actually still callbacks, but they sort of like it's being abstracted out, so you don't have to deal with callbacks directly. It makes the programming itself more elegant, because what you do is that you use what it's called an operator. You operate on the stream. Stream carries data, and then you want to transform the data. So over here too, so using functional style, then you have like streams that say carry some events that have some data. In this case, it's just a simple example of like data of one, two, and three. And then you want to apply an operator called map to it. So map is a very common operator that operates on streams. So what it does is basically transforms the data. In this case, the example is just a simple take the input and multiply it by 10. And so like if you 
if you put it into code over down here, it will be like an observable. For example, using like uh, uh, RxJava, you can do observable.just that takes in like one, two, three, your input, and basically operate on this stream using the map function that transforms it. So in this case, it's multiplied by 10. And then immediately, too, like your consumer is also in that same, in a programming syntax way, is that it's in the same command line statement. So it makes the programming a lot more cleaner. So if you think of the old ways, if you have to do this, then you have to have multiple command line that takes care of you know, all your data coming in and parsing and all that. But here, reactive programming, you can do them all in one, line, one command statement and do all these, like you chain all your functions together. And then you do a subscribe in here for your consumer. It consumes what's coming out of the result of the transformation. In this case, it's just simple, like printing it out, call item, uh, to you know, print it to the system console. So you see, for one, it will become item 10, and then two is 20, and item 30. So there are also like many um, operators, too. Um, but this map is like pretty commonly used um, in reactive programming. So if you're interested, too, you can also visit the rxmarbles.com. That has like a very interactive uh, website, too. So you can try out, for example, operators like Filter. Filter is another very common operator, too, that you can kind of see, too, like it will be very useful. For example, you, you're processing large streams of data. You want to, like, say, employee, some record coming in. You want to, like, filter out maybe certain people start before uh, 1980 and something like that. You can just simply do a filter operator on that stream. So without kind of the old way of doing things like if this and if that, you can actually do just simple, like, dot, um, like, filter, for example, on your stream. Okay. So now let me then turn a bit focus then into reactive systems. So again, reactive systems are not the same, right, as reactive programming because now we are kind of talking about a system that's, that has many components to it. They each are using their own reactive programming style to handle all their logic. But here, reactive systems, and we're dealing with all these components talking to each other. So here, too, they're broadly there are six types of patterns that you want that you handle, like in any reactive systems. Um, and this too is this set of patterns is broad systems. Is actually I, I took it from a book called Reactive Systems Design, and I'll have that link towards the end of this uh, set of slides too. So essentially, too, you have like for example, like state management and persistence patterns, like sharding and event sourcing. If you have heard of those, so those are more state management and persistence, dealing with the with you you know writing to the database and reading from it that type. And there's also flow control patterns, such as like pull and drop and throttling. Those are like flow control patterns. And there are message flow patterns, such as request response and um, ask pattern, forward flow and saga system. And those are like more um, flow. And then there's also fault tolerance and recovery patterns, such as like circuit breaker. It's a common, commonly used like fault tolerance type of pattern. Yeah. And um, then there's also replication uh, kind of uh, patterns as well. So replication, then we talk about like active, 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 passive. Those are like more replication patterns, but they're not like commonly used too. Like if you really get into deep into that, you can handle that. Um, you have to work with that. And then there are resource management patterns, such as like resource pool and manage blocking. All of these are resource management. So you can see, too, it deals with system on a higher level that you need to handle all aspects of it using those patterns. So. And just some more terminologies I like to point out, too. So I, earlier, too, I point out reactive systems itself. It actually lends itself really good to um, to design your, basically transform your older legacy systems into like microservices. Um, because in itself, reactive systems is meant to be more like less tight coupled. There's no tight coupling associated with it. So it lends itself real well if you want to break up your monolith systems into multiple microservices, each handle their own specific tasks, but they yet all need to come together and form a very consistent story, consistent like processing for your whole system. And it basically, reactive systems, is, it isolates your state, your space, your, um, your time and failure of a system. So it's kind of bring things on a more abstract level. 
And again, I want to point out too, circuit breaker, uh, kind of common patterns we use, um, basically to stop errors from pro propagating through your system. You handle it before it's spread out to the rest of your systems. And back pressure. So like, I just want to explain about back pressure again. Just now I talk about the reactive systems, like in, in Indian, um, the tra traffic, traffic pattern. But another ex um, example that I want to give about back pressure, for example, I was actually at a conference in the US to in North Carolina just a couple uh, weeks ago. It's called All Things Open in an open source um, conference. And actually, they gave everybody drink tickets. So as attendees, we go and kind of after party, we have drinks. But yet, there's only, there was only like one line for 5,000 people in the conference, only one line you know, in the bar, and then only two or three servers serving you drinks. So as you can see, that's when back pressure build up because you have demand coming in and the servers are trying to serve everybody drinks, but so many coming in, it's only one line. It's like if you think of computing terms, it's like single thread and you handle so many requests and guess what? It overflows the whole thing and eventually, actually, I waited in line for an hour, then at the end, the server said, well, sorry, we ran out the tickets. We already have reached the maximum, so we can't serve you anymore. So, you know, that kind of stuff. So can you imagine, like, in a real-life situation, that's what it is. But in computing systems, same thing. If you have, like, many requests and you still have a single thread, you know, kind of systems, then they can't really handle this kind of request scenario. So that's, like, an example of back pressure. And then another thing I want to point out is this CAP theorem. Maybe if some of you have heard of CAP theorem in a data-intensive um, system, right? So we, when we talk about reactive systems or any data system, we want data to be highly available, so that's responsive. And then also it's consistent, too, so the data itself has to be very accurate, too. And then CAP theorem basically is saying that in any data intensive systems, there are three aspects. So high availability and consistency of data and also the network partition. So network partition is essentially your data is connected to the network. And CAP theorem basically is saying that of these three aspects of any system, um, you always, you, you can only have two of which um, be in co co like coexist coexisting with each other. And because network partition is a given, you always have to have data connected to the network. So then it means either high availability or consistency of data will have to relax a little bit. And in this case, usually is that we will say, OK, the consistency of data may not be as important as high availability. So which means that like you can have, you know, so what it is is that it's encouraging you to keep querying your data. Um, and eventually, you get back results of data that's more accurate. And the reason is that updates can continue going on. And you, it, it's OK, even if you get back your results uh, not quite accurate. Because if you query it again, eventually, the update will slow down, so your data will become consistent. So that's like in a nutshell, that's what it is um, about this. So essentially, reactive systems do like handle this aspect of your system. OK, so here, I just want to also point out too, in reactive systems um, standard, so there's this um, reactive stream specification. So this is a, a standard for asynchronous stream processing with non-blocking uh, back pressure. And it doesn't actually specify. There's no implementation. If you go there, it's only interfaces. And also, there are only very few things. It's like publish, subscribe, and the pipeline, and, and basically the, the uh, uh, let's see, the results. And there are also streams, too. If you talk about streams, there's this concept of push streams and also pull streams. So in reactive streams, by nature, it is actually a pull stream. Um, it's kind of a pull and then a push. Um, so to, to explain about it, when you talk about push streams, is that if data comes, it's like without your client, consumer asking, the data will automatically be pushed to your clients. But for pool streams, it's more like, OK, data is ready, the publishing side. It will be up to the consumer to do a pool. So in like reactive Pivotal, for example, the reactor or reactive extension, you basically do a dot subscribe. When you do a dot subscribe, that's when you actually pull the results there. So in some ways, it's interesting. You have to do a pool before the data gets pushed to you. And that's reactive stream specification. And just to point out, too, if, if you ever work with OSGI, too, OSGI has a um, uh, push streams uh, specification, and that's a purely push streams um, kind of uh, scenario. And those things are really good. Push streams, for example, will be good for doing IoT because, like IoT devices, you have like streams of data coming in. So whenever data arrives at your devices, it get pushed to your destination without your destination asking for it. Um, so yeah. So 
those are some differences. Um, and just want to point out reactive streams are actually, they are started by um, uh, uh, Netflix and Pivotal and Lightband. Um, and right now, too, uh, the implementation includes Reactor, the R socket, reactive socket, and Arca streams, and even like MicroProfile. Eclipse has a MicroProfile. Um, not sure if you're anybody using like Java EE, like that there's a Eclipse has microprofile that manages microservices. So that also start to support like reactive streams 1.01 standard. So and this also is like another um, actually this is a, a slide that I borrow from um, the spring one like just a couple of weeks ago they had a big conference in Austin. I believe it's Austin, Texas, yes. And uh, so I kind of borrow from Pivotal. So there's actually a new foundation called Reactive Foundation. And they actually is, they kind of live off of Linux Foundation. So as such, it's open source, and it's essentially is the R socket um, that uh, it, that is kind of supporting. And um, just a very quick uh, kind of introduction to R socket too. And actually, Ola, who would be otherwise be here, he would be an expert in doing reactive socket. So it's an open source like layer five, six. Five and layer six kind of communication protocols that's based on reactive streams, and it's really fast and it's actually bidirectional too, and uh, so the, and and basically too essentially our socket is really good in also handling reactive back pressure and flow control too. So and uh, and it's basically it's agnostic to like your transport layer too. So you can have like TCP or like Aeron too, and uh, UDP too, I think it supports too, but it's just not as um, accurate if you do UDP. So this is just um, giving you some idea. So these are the companies that are currently founders of it, Facebook and Netify, Lightband and Vlingo, Alibaba and Pivotal. So. Okay, so now we go back a little bit, like what about like microservices, right, in reactive programming and reactive systems? So basically, um, Reactive programming is basically um, it's used within a single microservice. It's essentially, it's, it's your style of programming and everything. It's used for implementing your in, internal logic and your data flow, managing the data flow. But reactive systems are basically used in between the microservices. So think of it at a higher level. It's basically bridging all of the communications between the different components of a system. And that's how reactive systems are being used in a microservices ecosystem. Oops, this isn't working, yeah. Okay, so, and this one I'd like to also point out to, actually IBM, we actually have a partnership with uh, Lightband too. Um, and, uh, and basically now we are supporting all of their open source uh, libraries like Arca. And there's also for microservices, there's a library called Alagum, if you haven't already worked with it. It's built on top of like using Arca cluster and also Play Framework too. And so this is actually a, an opinionated microservices, uh, reactive microservices framework. And of course, I don't have time in here to go into details, but you can check them out too. So basically, it's, it's quite sophisticated, and it employs like domain-driven design and making use of event sourcing and CQRS, which is command query responsibility segregation, those patterns too. So if you're interested, you can check that out too. Okay, so now I go back to my uh, that noodle shop. Now I kind of I continue with that uh, thing. So I kind of use the noodle shop as an example of we can use like reactive uh, systems, um, reactive programming to kind of handle a noodle shop. Now in I was actually in Tokyo, and if you have to been to Tokyo too, they have noodle shop that you go inside. You you have to take care of ordering yourself. So basically, you go to a vending machine and then punch in what your order is. You then put in your money, and it doesn't take credit card. So then you, give, you get the ticket back, and basically give the ticket to the servers. And then they will then um, tell the cook to cook your noodles. However, they actually don't cook it right away. Because there are no formal tables and chairs for you to sit down to eat, it's like a bar. So like, look over there, right? It's just a bar. You sit around. So you can imagine in any noodle shop, there are very, very few tables because it's, you sit around bar area. But you get a long line of people. So in, in some sense, I was thinking in computing terms, it is not very 
efficient. Um, and if you're in computing terms, it's like you try to do a request for something. You go in, there's only one vending machine, and you have to put in your money, and then you get your tickets, and you give the tickets. Then you have to wait. So that's the thing with re reactive programming is that it allows a synchronous um, way of doing things. So how about if we kind of in a new way of doing things, like over here, I um, jot down this, like, roughly drawing out a picture, design thinking, right? Using a reactive way of, of solving that problem. So we can basically have mobile app. How about design a mobile app? And basically, a mobile app will take your order. So if we are busy programmers, we don't want any, you know, any wait time. Any time is precious to us. So then we can kind of like, oh, we're hungry, pull out our phone, order our food. So you place the order. And the order comes in, it's like an observable. For example, in an event, it's an order event comes in. And of course, this is simplified way. There are many things to do, but just to give you an idea. So you get, place an order, you have the event in your system. Then the observers in this case would be the waiters and waitresses. But yet, they can't really like, tell the cook to cook your noodles yet because you need to make sure that there's an open seat in the bar area. So there's also another observables that basically are receiving open seat event. So when their seats are open up in your spot and somebody comes in with the, an order, then basically the observers can then tell the cook to start cooking the noodles for you. And how about then if we design a system that notify when they start cooking, maybe they say, OK, great, you know, maybe they click on something and basically notify us, you know, the, the busy programmer waiting for our orders. And they get the order, um, uh, then, then they get the notif we get the notification, then we know, oh, noodles should be ready in 10 minutes, for example. So in the meantime, we can finish up what we're going to be doing. We get notified. When it comes time to go, we go to the restaurant, and you don't even have to wait. So that's the idea, essentially, like why we want reactive programming. Is this a synchronous nature? It saves you time. You can submit your request, and then you go do something else. You don't have to wait for it. There are mechanisms internally that handles how they tell you that things when things are ready. So that's essentially, you know, in, in like kind of a common, if you tell people what you're doing, that's what you can tell them. That's what reactive programming, reactive systems are meant to be for. So, okay. So I think I have about 10 minutes. So I'll then go into this last part of the presentation, which is the survey, a quick survey example of four, the four common libraries, Java tools and libraries. So for Rx Java, so again, so Rx Java is, Basically, Java implementation of Reactive X, Reactive Extension. Reactive Extension actually was um, came out of Microsoft. It was actually Rx.net before, and then Netflix took it and basically ported it to Java. They found a lot of um, very important concepts in in Rx, so they ported to Java, and then soon after too, then they're porting to RS, RxJS for JavaScript or for Scala, Clojure, all these other variants of Reactive Extension. The nice thing about them is that all of these different language implementation, they have similar APIs um, based on the Reactive Extension specification. And um, so again, in, Re in Rx Java, the version one came out was before the React Reactive Stream specification, so it does not have uh, flow control or does not have back pressure. So if you want to pick up, do something with Rx Java, it's actually very popular being used by Android applications too because they are actually quite kind of easy, easier to use and there's less of things you need to set up. So you basically want to use Rx Java too because that has the back pressure support in there. So here, let's just take a quick example of well, how would you do in um, Rx Java 2, right? So Say this is an example, you can use a flowable, basically it's the stream. So in this case, we want to do a hello world. This is actually, um, it simplifies your programming too. So you can basically use a flowable, it's essentially the, the stream that comes in from your command line. And you do a dot from array and you take the argument and basically then do a dot subscribe. So you consume what is coming in right away. And you do a simple system out print line, hello, and then the, the arguments that came in. So essentially, then that, that's how, like, I'm just illustrating for Rx Java, it can be done uh, quite elegantly in one line for a simple Hello World. And here, too, just want to point out Rx Java 2 example is that um, here, like, to get the input, the producer will be using observable.just or using flowable.just. You can take in the, the, um, the, your input of your stream, the data, 
And then the consumer, you can specify in this case is, in, in, this an example, is just printed to the standard output, uh, st standard, uh, standard console, so standard output. So system out print line. And then you can then basically, um, c uh, you, you attach your consumer to your producer by doing a sub dot subscribe. To, um, so that's how you do it. But I already showed this earlier too, so. Okay, so now then uh, we'll go on to talking about Project Reactor. So the Project Reactor is, comes out of um, from Pivotal and is similar to RX Java 2 because the the two engineering teams they are similar. These are open source projects, so essentially they are the same group of um, developers that contribute to RX Java 2 and also Reactor library. So you find that they are actually quite similar the two libraries, and. The nice thing about Reactor uh, library is that it, it's built for Java 8, so it's a bit more cleaner in interface than RX Java. So it's RX Java started when it was um, JDK 6, so it's a bit. It has some of the the version one has some of the older Java 6 support, but for um, Reactor, it's actually all Java 8 and above. Um, over here too, I just quoted David Canock, who is a an engineer, a lead that contributes to Reactor and also RX Java. He, he just said, use Reactor 3 if you are allowed to use Java 8, and use Java, uh, RX Java 2 if you are stuck on Java 6 or you need your fu functions to throw check exceptions. So that's just a quote from him. And then the, the different libraries, too. When, when you write your code for Reactor, you want to use the Reactor core library. That's what you mostly use. And then there are, there are other libraries that are for testing and the other extra Netty, it integrates well with Netty, Adapter, Kafka, RabbitMQ. And it has Reactive Streams, Foundation for .NET, and JavaScript, like incubating, too. OK, so this is uh, also an example, too, of code of comparing. Um, when, you do, when you use the, like say, traditional style of programming, using Spring MVC, the synchronous style, and also using uh, Spring Web Reactive, which is the non-blocking, the new way, the reactor way, so this is the, these two sets of code, they probably look similar, but actually, in, rea in reality, when you run it, it's different. Why? Because if you look at it, the traditional approach here, we're using Spring MVC. So you do in Spring MVC, you just like do this, and you say you print out, and you say traditional way started. And then basically, you go then do get products. In this case, what will happen in here is that the get products will block. So your method will basically wait. At that point, it gets there. It will just wait, waiting for the list of products to come back. And then when it all comes back, your list of products is back, then you will see your traditional way completed, and then your method will exit. Whereas if you use the reactive approach, it was really the asynchronous style using Spring Web Reactive Web Flux. So you do basically do a get all. And basically, you want to re return a flux. So flux is basically streams, and they are like zero to like multiple streams. And there's also mono, which is only one stream, just so you know. But in this example, I'm using a flux, meaning you can re return many streams in this case. So we want to do a get all. And so if you run, put this in the runtime, you first see reactive way using flux started. And then you then call the pro get product stream that will return your flux. But what will happen in this case if you run it, then you actually get back this line that says reactive way using flux completed before you actually get back the list of products. The reason is that it's an it's a, a asynchronous call. So essentially, when you say get product stream, the request gets sent out, and you just get back you know, the flux in the meantime. And your method itself will exit before you actually get back. Um, I mean, unless it can get processed really fast, but most likely, too, is that you will see the, the system out print line first before you actually get back the results. And one thing just want to point out, too, OK, and then you may be asking, well, then how do you, um, how do you actually get the results? So essentially, it's the same way, too. It's basically it will fill up the sync in like asynchronous programming. Right? You basically have results coming back to your sync, and you basically can then use an HTTP and get your results back that way, too, uh, from your flux. But then over here, too, there's an annotation in here. We're doing a get mapping, and then we have actually using this text event stream value. Essentially, you want to subscribe to the service sent event. So to kind of make it truly uh, reactive is that your client can basically say, OK, I want to like, subscribe to the server event. The server will basically 
have an event when the server is done processing, getting all the data. So if you subscribe to that, then your client can then basically listen to um, the server being like done with the list of, pro uh, list of results. Then you can then go and kind of you know, get your results back and process it too. So there are different ways of doing it. But I won't go into all the detail, but just to let you know. OK. And I think I have about six minutes. So just a quick thing. So here is just comparison between RX Java and Spring Reactor. But I think I talked about most of it already. But I'll give these slides to you too. And essentially, too, um, Spring Reactor is the one that's uh, newer and supports Java 8. Um, it's, it's, but they essentially both are event driven and they support reactive streams. And Spring Reactor will fully support reactive streams. Uh, RX Java, you want to use RX Java 2 that has the back pressure and reactive stream support. So, OK. So I'll go into ACA then. So ACA is basically, again, comes from Lightband, and is IBM has a partnership with them. And right now, we're mainly, too, working with them just promoting their open source ACA library. Um, and essentially, ACA makes use of this model. Um, it's called Actor Model. Um, Actor Model uh, came from Erlang. And it's basically the actor model, a programming model from the 80s. So it's not really, actor model is not a new thing. It came from the 80s. It's highly um, event driven and actually very lightweight and has really good location transparency. So then you don't have to worry about location, dealing with the location and everything. Because ACA abstracts out a lot of these complicated things and you can basically configure it. And also it runs very well in like ACA cluster as well. And there's this supervisor capability I want to point out, which is kind of a, like a, a specialty, a special feature of, of actor model. So, so supervisor, essentially, actor model is, a, is a, like a tree structure. So it has a supervisor capability. So think of like a tree structure. You have your main actor. You start off your system, its main actor. And essentially, too, it's like a supervisor. So if some of your children are not, you know, there are too many, too many requests coming in. So like say your child, one of your child act is overloaded, basically your child can tell the supervisor. It's like in real life example too, if you have, you, you have too much work to do, you tell your manager you got too much to do. It's kind of the same thing. So your child actor is too busy, then you can tell your supervisor, um, the root kind of actor or the one above, and say, I'm too busy. Then the, the supervisor then will be responsible for kind of even out the load for you. So that's kind of like a built-in kind of capability inside ACA. That's kind of pretty nice, too. So. so here, just a quick example, then, of Hello World. So in Hello World, if you want to do it in ACA, this, again, it's a sample. So over here, too, we, everything is being handled in ACA is actor model. So this example would say you start off ACA.main.main. You start up the main engine. And basically, you start your Hello World dot class. And it, Hello World itself is an actor. It implements the uh, abstract uh, actor, so we'll take a look. So over here, too, basically it, it extends the abstract actor in here, the hello world. But the thing to kind of point out to you is over here, too, the, the one, there's a, what it does when it receives any kind of events, it will do that. But we want to also take a look, too, in the pre-start. So the pre-start is what gets called when you start up your hello world. So here, in this case, too, because everything is an actor, so when Hello World starts, it's actually create another actor. This actor, in this case for a Hello World, will be a greeter actor. So over here, you can see, too, um, just to sort this out, it's basically you, you start your greeter. So your greeters basically do a dot get context and actor off, and basically then you create your greeter class. That's your greeter. And at this point, too, is that the greeter will get started, but the greeter won't do anything until some events come in then it will do something. But so let's take a look at the greeter, what it will do. So it, hopefully here, your greeter will also extend an abstract actor. It's, again, it's an actor, child actor. So basically, there are like two types of messages. It's either a greet and also a done. So over here, if it receives a message, some events coming in, then what it will do is that basically do a match equals, if it is a greeting, so a hello world case, you want to come in and you say, do a greeting. So what it does is, all it does is doing hello world. That's what it is. After it does hello world, it basically tell the, the sender, it says, I'm done. Essentially send back you know, the, the message is, I'm done. And that's all. So you can tell, in some ways, too, ACA maybe takes more lines of code. But the actor system, if you can imagine, um, 
in a much larger system like that han handles like concurrency is actually quite sophisticated too. So yeah, so I invite you to take a look into it too and see if that might be something that you can apply in your particular case. So, oops, I think I only have like two minutes. So okay, so this one is an example in. in uh, Aka is space or the hello world in Scala. If you do Scala, you notice Scala itself is functional in nature. It's a lot kind of lighter weight and it's a lot, it, it, the syntax, everything is just much like fewer lines of code too than Java. So, but I won't go into detail. Okay, so now the last thing is about Vertex. Um, I guess I remember someone in the audience at Vertex too. So Vertex, I um, just want to point out quickly, basically it's very flexible. It's an Eclipse open source project. And it's a polyglot framework. And why? Because it um, interoperates really well with other language frameworks, too. So in other words, because of the nature of it, you can actually um, have like your Java, and you can also run and have JavaScript component that is vertex too, and Ruby, for example. So it's, it's highly polyglot in nature. And it doesn't have what it calls like actor model, but it's similar in kind of concept will be a verticals. So they are basically components that are deployed and executed by the Vertex engine. It's event-driven, and they run only when they receive a message. It's kind of typical of any reactive systems. So, and it also has a Vertex as an event bus that handle all of these events, too. Um, so again, the, the Vertex libraries is, can be used with other libraries. It doesn't get tied to any container. It's very flexible in nature. So, oops. OK, so this is the Hello World example. If we want to do it in Vertex, you can do it in, for example, like this very um, elegantly done all chained together Vertex. And you do a Vertex and create HTTP server and basically chain it and do a request handler and basically have your request come in and then immediately it's basically the response is there and it just essentially sends back hello world. And you have a dot listen. It's basically for your HTTP server to bind it to port 8080 in this case. So you can see too, actually, it's Vertex it's actually quite elegant too. It's, it's very kind of it's gaining popularity too, from my understanding. So, okay. So I think I'm kind of little over time. So just want to bring this uh, a quick recap and takeaways. So reactive is really an overloaded world in today's market. I think maybe less of so now. But when I first started doing this talk, it was still earlier this year. It seems like it was a lot of reactive. But, but I think over time it gets sorted out and explained a lot clearer to everybody. Um, but ultimately, too, why we want reactive systems is because we're going after highly responsive systems in an event-driven world because it mimics really human beings, too. We, are, we do things, we don't sit and wait around. You know, we're responding to events that comes in. And I explained to some of the reactive programming is not the same as functional reactive programming or reactive systems. And some of the reactive on the programming level, some benefits of it being very elegant. And also, uh, reactive systems and architecture basically bring reactivity to a higher level. And one thing to point out is that reactivity is actually not truly kind of fully ready on all levels because the database engine themselves, none of the uh, relational database comes out with any non-blocking I.O. yet. They are all doing blocking I.O. So if you think of like a big system, you think you build all reactive, you're using reactive style, reactive kind of way of doing things. But when it gets out to the relational database, it's still blocking. All those calls are blocking on that level. But the thing is, you may be hearing about R2DBC, for example. That's the database driver. So it's connectivity. You're connecting to the database uh, using non-blocking asynchronous uh, driver. So that's there, like R2DBC coming from Pivotal, I think. Yeah. And then there's also, uh, there's also Slick, too, from, uh, from um, Scala. It's a Scala called Slick from Lightband, but that's all in Scala, too. Um, and it's community version. Um, then Mongo, too. Also, uh, Spring also has Mongo. That, oh, actually, that's uh, R2DBC also supports that. It's highly um, non-blocking in nature. OK, so it, uh, with this, it comes to the end. And I want to thank you all for being so patient to sit through. And if you want to reach me, this is how you can reach me on these things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And then also want to point out and invite you to, if you haven't already done so, and actually IBM Cloud, oh, maybe it's, I'll, I'll have my slides, but there's a link to sign up for free IBM Cloud access too. And there's no time limit to it. You can like try different things out. So there was like a, a, like a short URL, tiny URL. So please watch for that. And thank you so much again for coming. Yeah, okay. <laughs>